things the subject is vast and uh, in today's uh, class we will be concluding the second unit on oscillators resonances and waves and one can discuss very many very fascinating aspects of resonances quality factor and so on and so forth. Uh, our plan in this course is not to give a very exhaustive review of these topics, but to introduce um, undergraduate students to basic principles uh, of oscillatory motion and damping and you know other things that we have been talking about to get some sort of an introduction. And uh, we will provide some further uh, you know uh, acquaintance with important consequences of oscillatory motion leading to the behavior of resonances and waves. So, here is a picture and you can actually see a movie there is a website at the bottom here and you do not have to write down this link, but if you just google this Tacoma bridge you will get this link easily on the internet and you can actually see a video this is a uh, Tacoma bridge in Washington state. This was a bridge about uh, nearly 2 kilometers uh, long one of the largest suspended bridges of that time. Uh, this was you know uh, in 1940, so uh, but th this is a very famous story. Uh, what happened is that this uh, this bridge collapsed in a very dramatic way on the 7th of November 1940 and actually it's, it, it turns out that it was part of the reason that this happened is because there were strong winds which were blowing and these winds generated certain oscillations in the bridge. The bridge had its own internal natural frequency of oscillation and the wind speed at 50 to 70 kilometers per hour they produced a, a driving force a periodic driving force because of the manner in which the winds were blowing and it led to a resonant type of phenomenon which eventually caused the amplitude of oscillation to become so large that the bridge could not sustain itself and it actually snapped. So, this is the movie that you can see and the basic phenomenon I means it is it is not nice to think about tragic events in terms of mere physics and differential equations, but essentially that is precisely what it really boils down to and the important thing over here is to understand that the differential equations that we set up. I mean, this is not just abstract mathematics, it is real, it describes real physical phenomenon and then it is real events which can be analyzed and understood in terms of the differential equations and the damping coefficients and so on. This has got consequences not just in classical mechanics, but also in quantum theory and here is a situation in which I do not want to find any one of you, because uh, I hope that you will not need it. Uh, this is the picture of uh, MRI, MRI scanner and uh, this is a very powerful tool in uh, a diagnostic tool in modern medical technology and this is based on uh, the principle of nuclear magnetic resonance. So, this is again a resonant phenomenon, this is a quantum phenomenon in which you have got an intrinsic property which a nucleus has called as the spin and I will of course, not discuss that uh, over here, but it is this spin which when subjected to a certain periodic electromagnetic oscillation that leads to a resonant phenomenon. And then when you exploit the properties of the magnetic resonance, you can use it to map individual you know biological trends in the body at a cellular level and that becomes a very powerful uh, diagnostic tool in medical technology. So, the phenomenon of resonance is common in 
classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, there are I do not know hundreds, thousands, very many examples and it is for this reason that this is an extremely important subject to learn. Furthermore, the subject of oscillations is of fundamental importance in understanding how information is transmitted from one part to another, how propagation of energy takes place from one part to another, uh, digital signal processing for example. And we will get some kind of acquaintance in this last class to some of these ideas. What is the wave phenomenon and how is the oscillatory behavior at the bottom of all of this analysis. So, we will first look at a pulse and you know what a pulse is means if you just uh, feel uh, at your wrist you can feel your own pulse and you see periodic you know pulsations which are generated by, a, by the biorhythms um, at a certain regular frequency with which the heart is pumping blood through your body. So, what, what is crossing a particular point? is a pulse and this pulse is sometimes also called as a wave packet. It is actually made up of a large number of sinusoidal waves and these sinusoidal waves they come from the solutions to the oscillatory problem that we have discussed earlier. So, let us see what a pulse is really like. So, here you see in this picture the uh, a, a pulse at time t equal to 0 and it has got a peak which is centered at x equal to 0. So, you have got an x axis and the x equal to 0 is over here under this vertical black line and this is where the peak of the pulse is. And then this pulse which is a superposition of a large number of sinusoidal waves, these different sinusoidal waves each has its own wavelength which is lambda each component wave travels at its own speed which is called as a phase velocity and this phase velocity is equal to the product of the natural frequency nu times the wavelength. And at a later time at t equal greater than 0 the pulse will be at a different location. It will move away from the origin through a distance v t depending on the time at which you are seeing it and it will be described by since it is moving with time the argument will be phase shifted through the factor v t. Now, the shape of the pulse in the example that I have considered has not changed and this is going to happen when each component you know all the components travel together. So, this happens in a medium which is said to be non dispersive. So, each component you know the, the very many different components which must be superposed to generate a wave packet or a pulse when they travel together uh, and they can travel together only in a medium which is said to be non dispersive. So, so this also gives us the very definition of what a dispersive medium is and what a non dispersive medium is. So, the shape of the pulse must remain intact as time progresses. Now, a lot of this analysis is due to uh, Jean Fourier and uh, he uh, lived between 1768 and 1830. He was at this Ecole Polytechnic uh, at Paris and uh, one of the very brilliant mathematicians and physicists who contributed so much to the analysis of wave motion and we find this being used in just about every branch of physics and engineering including quantum mechanics and optics, um, electrodynamics you name it and we make use of Fourier methods. So, we will get some idea about what this analysis is about. Uh, the Fourier theorem can be stated in somewhat simple terms and I am not going into the rigorous mathematics of this because we really do not have the time for it. But 
essentially in some sense what it does is it tells us that any periodic function, any phenomenon which occurs with a certain periodicity, it can be anything it, which is a repetitive phenomenon, which repeats itself at a certain frequency. It can be written as a sum of simple oscillating functions namely the sine and the cosine function. Now, this is an amazing feature. This is absolutely incredible that you look at any periodic function and you can always write it as a superposition of the sine and cosine functions which are very simple functions to use. Everybody knows what a sine and a cosine function is and in terms of the sine and cosine functions you can write anything and everything that has got any kind of periodicity and this comes from the Fourier methodology and we will to see how these methods work. Let us plot a function which I have written on this uh, equation for f x. This function is defined in terms of another function h which is called as a heaviside function. So, h of x is a heaviside function, it is also sometimes called as the step function and the definition of the heaviside function is a very simple one. So, let us first define the heaviside function, once we know what the heaviside function is, then instead of the argument x, we must put the argument x over l and then we get the first term, subtract from it the heaviside function for a different argument which is not x over l, but x over l minus 1 and then you subtract from this result after multiplication by 2 a factor of 1 and you can get the function f of x. So, that is how you will get the function of x. So, everything is defined in terms of the heaviside function and the definition of the heaviside function is very simple. It is equal to 0 if x is less than 0 and if it is greater than 0 it is equal to 1. So, that is part of the reason it is called as a step function because at x equal to 0 its value suddenly in one step shoots up from 0 to 1. Okay. And we are interested in plotting the function f of x in the range 0 to twice l where l is some length parameter. So, let us first have a look at the heaviside function. So, for x less than 0 it is 0, so it is indicated by this green line okay. and for x greater than 0 it is equal to 1. So, that is what generates the step. So, this is the heaviside step function. Now, that we know what h of x is, we have to find what how to plot h of x over l in a range of x which goes from 0 to 2 l. Oh, that is a fairly straightforward thing to do and I will le let you work it out in details in your notebooks and I will plot the result over here, but now you know how to do that. So, you have an x axis, this is the 0 of the x axis, the, here is a point at x equal to l and here is a point at x equal to 2 l and it is in this range that we have to find what this function f of x is. So, if you just substitute the value of the argument to x over l and then construct this difference multiplied by 2, subtract 1 out of it, you will get the function f of x. Now, this is what the function f of x turns out to be and you see that it is a square wave. Okay. So, it is coming from a sequence of these step functions, the manner in which you have defined the function f of x and this is actually a square wave. Now, suppose this square wave were to repeat itself, then you have a phenomenon which is periodic and you would expect that this can be written as a sum of sine or cosine waves. Okay. Now, this does not quite look like a sine function, everybody has the picture of a sine function in your mind. right? It has some similarity to a sine function, but the differences are more visible than the similarities, because this has got sharp edges. right? A sine function does not have any cuts, okay. there are no angularities in the sine function. It is a very smooth function, which varies between minus 1 and 1. 
So, here also we have chosen a function which varies between minus 1 and 1. It is a repetitive function, it does not have to be minus 1 and 1, it can be from minus n to plus n, you can always scale it by an appropriate factor and normalize it to unit magnitude. So, that is not an issue. Now, it turns out that this can actually be written as a sum of sine waves and I strongly encourage you to do this exercise on your own using some graphical plotting routine on your personal computers. Okay? And I have used a graphic software, which comes in the software called origin to plot this graph. And this function, this is a function of theta, which I have generated here, which is written as a superposition of these sine functions, but it is a very peculiar superposition. The argument is n theta, where n can take only odd numbers, all the way from 1 through infinity, but it will take only odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, all the even numbers are omitted. Okay? And then each sine term is divided by the corresponding n. So, it is 1 over n sin n theta summed over n going from 1 through infinity and this is just some normalizing factors. So, do not worry too much about it and if you do it, you can get depending on how many terms you put in the summation. Now, the summation is go up to infinity and if you take it too seriously, you will spend your lifetime and beyond doing this summation. Okay? not just your lifetime, but also beyond it. So, I do not want you to spend the rest of your life doing this. Just take the first term, n equal to 1. Okay? n equal to 1 is sin theta divided by 1, which is again sin theta. And then you get this black curve, this one. This is sin theta. Here it goes. And this is the usual sin theta that you see. right? Then you add to that, sin 3 theta divided by 3. Okay? Then you add to that sin 5 theta divided by 5. And if you go up to 5 theta and just stop there, okay? you are supposed to go up to infinity, but you decided that you will not do it. So, you stop just at 2 terms, forget the infinite. At 5 theta, if you stop, you get the red curve. This is the red curve which goes like this, it wiggles over here, wiggles further and then it dips, sorry, it, it dips to negative values, wiggles over here and gets back. Okay? If you go further up to 9 theta, if you add to the previous sum, the 7 theta by 7 and then also sin 9 theta by 9, you get the green curve and now you see that it is looking more and more like the square wave that you have met in the previous graph. Okay? So, this is the square wave and you see that this summation is looking more and more look, it is looking more and more like the square wave of this picture. And it, I, I, I strongly urge you to do this, because all you have to do is to add just a few terms and you can do this plotting on a small graphics calculator, if, if you like, or you can plot these graphs on a piece of graph paper, or you can do it on some computer with a graphics plotting routine. Now, here is another periodic wave, which is a triangular wave. Okay? This is a triangular wave. It is also called as a sawtooth wave for obvious reasons, it looks like a sawtooth. And this is a summation in which you have again the odd multiples of the angle theta. So, you have sin theta in the first term, sin 3 theta in the second term, sin 5 theta in the next term and so on. But then the denominator is not the corresponding n integer, but it is the square. So, sin 3 theta divided by 3 square, sin 5 theta divided by 5 square sin 7 theta divided by 7 square, square and notice that the alternate signs 
are different. This is a minus sign, you have got a plus sign and then a minus sign over here and a plus sign over here. So, if you construct a superposition and for different periodic functions, the details will different, but I have illustrated this for two functions, two, two periodic functions, one a square wave, the other is a triangular wave and you can see that you can generate any periodic phenomenon in terms of a superposition of just sine and cosine functions. So, uh, no matter what the nature of the function is and if it is true for the square function and for the triangular function which for which we could see the Fourier decomposition so easily, it is in fact true for any periodic phenomenon no matter what the shape of the pulse may be. Okay. As long as it is a repetitive phenomenon and in general means what we, have, we, we did was to plot only a function of x, but a physical phenomenon may be a function of both space and time. So, a pulse will be written as a function f of x as well as time or more generally in three dimensions as a function of the position vector which will have three components x, y and z or no matter what coordinate system you are using. So, it will be a function of space coordinates and the time coordinate and this is typically called as a pulse or a wave function or whatever. Okay. So, it is and, and you can expect it to be decomposed into sine and cosine functions if it has got a periodic element. And now, the periodicity can be either with respect to x, with respect to the space coordinate or it can be with respect to the time coordinate or with respect to both. Okay. So, in general it is periodic with respect to both which is how the wave packets you know traverse in space and time. So, you have got in general a function of space and time and you have these pulses or wave packets which propagate with time and you can easily do a Fourier analysis of these functions. And here the basic solutions are coming from the sinusoidal and the cosine function. These were the solutions of our simple harmonic oscillator. The solution was e to the i omega 0 t that was a basic solution right. So, what is that? That is a cosine term and a sine term. So, the solutions of the simple harmonic oscillator are fundamental to this analysis, fundamental to the phenomenon of oscillators, damped oscillators, damped and driven oscillators, resonances, wave motion as well, transmission of energy, electrodynamics, quantum mechanical wave functions, everything comes under the application as, as a part of an application of the basic analysis that we have learned from solving the differential equation for the simple harmonic oscillator. Now, as I mentioned a typical wave packet will have a superposition of different sinusoidal waves. Each sinusoidal wave will have its own wavelength. Each sinusoidal wave will be traversing at its own speed and as long as the speed of all these different components is the same in a medium and that will depend on the properties of the medium obviously. right? So, if this speed remains the same then the shape of the wave packet will not change. So, it will traverse without any distortion and this is the characteristic feature of a medium which is non dispersive whereas, in a dispersive medium the shape will change and you talk about the wave packet spreading because it sort of it does not retain its shape and it spills out of the original shape that it started out with. So, let us look at this wave function this is a function of z and t it is a function of both space as well as time right. So, the space parameter is z or z and the time parameter is t. So, the phase velocity of this particular wave is given by this ratio uh, omega over k or nu lambda which is the product of the wavelength and the frequency. The frequency is nothing but 
the inverse periodic time. Notice that at a fixed z, at a fixed position, this is a harmonic function in time. So, as time changes at a fixed point, the value of this function will change harmonically, like a sinusoidal function or a cosine function, right. Likewise, at a fixed time, this will represent a harmonic oscillation in space. So, if you will plot it as a function of the space coordinate at a fixed time, if you take a snapshot in your camera at a particular instant of time, it will look like this picture on the screen and this is the obvious definition of a wavelength, which is the distance between two points of corresponding phases and then the peak here is a crest and then the bottom here is a trough. The maximum displacement is what you call as the amplitude. So, these are the important parameters of this analysis for this analysis, which is the frequency, the time period, the wavelength, the amplitude and the phase. Now, let us spend some time discussing this phase. The phase function is omega t minus k z this is the phase function. At a given z, at a fixed value of z, the phase varies linearly with time. Omega t is a linear function with of time. If you plot this angle as a function of time, it will be a straight line, right? Because it is scaled by a factor omega, which is a constant and then the power of t is t to the power 1. So, this is a linear function of time, it goes as the first power of time and on the for a fixed time, it is a linear function of space, because the function of space. So, far as this angle is concerned, the phase angle is concerned is this k z, right. So, for a, for a fixed time, this is a linear function of z. So, in the medium, if you look at how the surface of constant phase would propagate, then this omega t minus k z, this phase will have to be constant for all points on that surface of constant phase. So, this argument would be 0. So, d phi is equal to 0 and d phi is the differential of omega t minus k z which is omega d t minus k d z. So, essentially what you have is omega d t minus k d z equal to 0. So, from this relation you immediately get that d z by d t is equal to omega over k. So, this is what gives you the phase velocity. Okay. The phase velocity is given by how through what distance the surface will have to move at a certain in a certain amount of time okay, and that ratio delta z by delta t in the limit delta t going to 0, this ratio will be exactly equal to omega over k and this is the definition of a phase velocity for a particular wave. So, this is the speed at which a wave front which is defined by a surface at a certain fixed phase that could be any fixed point, it does not have to be the crest it does not have to be the trough, any particular phase that you track, but you see that all how that particular point propagates in space and time and this will give you the corresponding phase velocity. So, omega over k would be a constant and this is a property of non dispersive medium this is called non dispersive waves. It makes it sound as if this is the property of the wave, but it is more a property of the medium in which the wave is propagating, because whether this omega over k will be a constant or not depends on the medium rather than on the wave. So, it is a property of the medium. So, this is like transferred epithet in which you have a description of the medium, but you use it to describe the wave. So, in a dispersive medium, the behavior is not so simple, 
because the omega versus k relationship in a dispersive medium is not just a linear straight line relationship. So, it is a little more complicated, it depends um, on the wavelength that you are talking about. So, this omega which should be plotted actually as a function of k and the reason it happens is that it you know depending on the properties of the medium you may have different dispersive relationships and uh, I, I will show you some of these examples uh, when you, when you deal with refraction for example this is the kind of thing which leads to a refraction in a medium because uh, the medium disperses the different wavelengths the, the different frequencies so that you get when light travels through a prism for example it spreads out in different components. So, before we get to that let us deal with superposition of waves, because typically a wave packet will consist of several components which are superposed on each other. So, here you have an example of a superposition of two waves, one for which the frequency is omega 1 and the wave number which is 2 pi by lambda is k 1 and for the other the corresponding parameters are omega 2 and k 2 and let us assume for the sake of simplicity that both have the same amplitude a. So, you construct a superposition of such two waves and all you do to work out this analysis is simple trigonometric relations like the addition and subtraction of uh, cosine and sine angle. So, you can work out the algebra quite sim in a simple manner and if you play with these terms using ordinary you know trigonometry relations which are the usual trigonometry identities you can construct the superposition of this by writing the cosine of these two terms and then combining the corresponding terms and you find that this net function psi the superposition can be written as a single sinusoidal wave. Now, the cosine wave is also called as a sinusoidal wave, the cosine function after all looks just like the sinusoidal wave, it is only phase shifted by pi by 2 right. So, it is still called as a sinusoidal wave, but this is a cosine function. So, you write this wave function this psi z of t which is coming from a superposition of two cosine functions as a single cosine function. That is the net result of the superposition with the difference that the frequencies and the wave numbers are however, different. The frequency is neither omega 1 nor omega 2 and the wave number k is neither k 1 nor k 2. Okay. It comes as a result of the superposition and these frequencies. So, here you have an average frequency and here you have an average wave number. So, the average frequency uh, um, is, is just the arithmetic average of these two frequencies, the average wave number is just the arithmetic average of these two wave numbers. So, these are the average frequency and the average wave numbers that you get in the argument of the cosine function. Now, when you construct the arithmetic average, you take the sum of the two and divide it by two. The amplitude itself comes not from the sum, but from the difference of the corresponding term. Okay. And this amplitude is called as a modulated amplitude, it is neither a it is nor this factor, but it comes it is modulated and it is modulated. So, this, this amplitude is a mod and this requires another function which is coming from the modulated frequencies and the modulated wave number. And these modulated frequencies and the modulated wave numbers are coming from the differences between the two frequencies omega. So, omega mod is omega 1 minus omega 2 divided by 2 and the k mod is k 1 minus k 2 by 2. Okay. So, this is how now this comes from plane trigonometry there is no magic over here. We can now ask the question, you now have a modulated function 
which is the sinusoidal wave a cosine function and at what speed does the modulated modulation propagate. Because this will be a function of space and time and you can ask at what speed is this modulation traveling. How will you find that out? What you will have to do is to find you know we, we, we look at this argument v mod t minus k mod t z. Okay. This is the argument and this must remain constant. Okay. So, what is the condition for that is what we will find and to do that you set the differential of this argument to 0. So, this is differential of this argument set equal to 0 and you get a condition for the ratio omega mod over k mod. So, that will give you the corresponding d z by d t. So, d z by d t which is given by the ratio of this omega mod to k mod which is nothing but the ratio of the difference in the two frequencies as we have seen to in the denominator we have the difference in the corresponding wave numbers. So, it is delta omega by delta k and this modulation then travels at a different speed this is what you call as the group velocity. So, there is a difference between the group velocity and the phase velocity. So, the phase velocity is what we described earlier this is the phase this is the velocity at which the individual sinusoidal waves propagate and this is the entire modulation how it propagates at what speed. So, that is given by the group velocity. And in non dispersive media the wave packet spreads. So, let us see an example um, over here and here you have a case of refraction and you have got light which travels along this ray and then when it crosses the surface of a medium it bends this is the phenomenon of refraction. And we ask the question why does light have to go from A to B to C why can it not go from A to B prime to C? Why should it this take this particular path? Why should it not take some other path? Why should it not come here and then bend at this angle? Right? So, there is some reason why it takes a particular path and this comes from the variational calculus. This is a, a subject that we dealt with in unit 1 in which we talked about the evolution of a mechanical system being described not by the principle of causality, but by the principle of variation namely the Hamilton's principle of variation. We argued that a system evolves in time such that action is an extremum and in this context it translates to what is called as the Fermat's principle that the time taken by light to go from A to B to C rather than A to B prime to C for any other path through some other point B prime anywhere on the surface compared to any other path this will be the least time. So, this is the principle of least action and you can see it very easily because all you have to do is to write the expression for the time taken for light to go from A to B and from B to C and the sum total of this is the total time taken by light to reach C through the point B. right? So, what is this? This time is divided by the distance by the speed of light and the speed of light is not the same in the two media. Okay? So, it is V 1 in the medium 1 which is the upper medium and it is V 2 in the lower medium. So, this time is the distance over here which is given by the sum of the squares of this distance and this by the Pythagoras theorem. So, this distance is the square root of a square plus x square right? divided by the, by the speed in that medium which is v 1 and then over here the speed is different which is v 2 and this is the hypotenuse for this right angle triangle and you can see that the corresponding distance is if from this green line to this green line is d and this to here is x then the distance between 
these two green lines, the second and the third green line is d minus x. So, you have to take the square of this distance and this distance is b. So, b square plus d minus x whole square and then you take the square root to take the to get the length of the hypotenuse itself divided by the, by the speed of light in medium 2 and this gives you the total time traverse uh, that is required for light ray to go from A to B to C. And you can ask what will be the change in this time if the ray were to go not through the point B, but through some other point like B prime. If it were to go through some other point B prime, what would change? It is this distance x, because when it goes through the point B, this is the value of x, which I am pointing out by this pointer. Whereas, if it goes through the point B prime, this will be the corresponding distance, right. So, this distance is a measure of which point on the surface the light ray will go through. So, if you take the derivative of the time taken by t with respect to this measure, which is x d t by d x, all you do is to take the differential of the right hand side with respect to x. Now, that is simple algebra. What you do is take d t by d x, find this out, solve it. Okay? No need to write down these terms in your notebooks. All you have to do is to take the derivative of t with respect to x and then demand that this derivative is 0 because by Fermat's principle, it is going to take the least time. So, at that least time, this derivative must vanish. So, put this equal to 0, which means that this there are two terms, this minus this and this difference must vanish. So, you will get a relation for the ratio of v 1 over v 2. Okay? And that is exactly what you get, because this ratio will turn out to be given by the trigonometric properties of the triangles that you have, the right angle triangles that you have constructed. And you get a very simple relationship that the sin theta 1 upon sin theta 2 is equal to the ratio of the two speeds. Okay? And this ratio of the two speeds is what the refractive index of the medium is. Okay? Now, that we know what the refractive index of a medium is, we understand dispersion very easily by recognizing that this refractive index actually changes with frequency. It is not the same for all the components in white light. Okay? And because this refractive index changes for different frequencies, then you have the different waves going at different speeds in different media and since they go at different speeds, then they are going to spread out. Now, that is exactly what happens and this is what generates for us what a dispersive medium is and you find that at the bottom of all of this is the simple algebra of simple harmonic oscillator. Okay? And it is for this reason, this is one of the hundreds and thousands of examples in physics and engineering, why we learn this and you know it is not our intention here to study the dynamics of wave packets or the Fourier analysis or optics, let alone quantum optics and any details, but just to give a flavor of the applications of the range of phenomena which for which a very clear and comprehensive rigorous understanding of the oscillator and the damped oscillations and the resonances and so on is important. Now, this is the phenomenon of dispersion. You find that this refractive index changes with frequency. So, different wavelengths will disperse when passing through a medium and this is the famous experiment by Newton and then you have the red at the top and the blue at the bottom. This is how the waves spread out and uh, this is what is called as normal dispersion. Uh, there are peculiar properties of different media and 
you find that the refractive index give, is given by the ratio of the two speeds. So, it is the speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in the medium. The speed of light in vacuum is usually written as the letter c, which is a universal constant. And the speed of a wave as we have seen earlier when we discussed the phase velocity is nothing but the product of the frequency and the wavelength. right? So, the product of the frequency and the wavelength is this nu lambda, but the lambda will have to be different for the same frequency, okay? because these two speeds are different. The refractive index is not equal to 1, only when the refractive index is equal to 1 will these two speeds be equal, the numerator and the denominator will be equal. Otherwise, the two speeds are different and the two wavelengths will be different and the corresponding wave numbers are different, because the wave number is just the reciprocal wavelength. It is 2 pi over lambda, which is what defines a wave number. So, this is the ratio of the, uh, of the wave number for the medium divided by the wave number for vacuum. So, in a medium you will have um, omega, which is given by the V medium divided by lambda times 2 pi of course, because you are writing for the circular frequency. And now, you know that this V medium over lambda medium, if you just swap this term from, from this relation over here, this will come from uh, dividing the speed of light by the refractive index. And because the refractive index depends on frequency, the medium becomes dispersive. So, it is the medium which is dispersive, but you often say that the waves are dispersive. So, now you can see that if you plot a graph between omega and k, omega versus k, okay, you plot k on the x axis and omega on the y axis. Then omega versus k is related by this particular factor proportionality. Now, if this proportionality were the same for all the frequencies, you will of course, get a linear relation. But if this proportionality changes with frequency, you cannot get a linear relation. Okay? Now, this is the characteristic feature of a dispersive medium that the omega versus k graph will not be linear, because for different frequencies, you will have a different proportionality between omega and k. Now, this is exploited in modern physics and I am not going to be able to discuss this at all, but physicists play with this and they are able to control the speed of light actually bring it to a halt depending on how you control um, uh, the, the, the properties of light propagation. This leads to very fascinating applications like electromagnetic uh, induced transparency and so on. Uh, these are all specialized topics in quantum optics and this is only to excite some of those who will be interested in some applications. Uh, but the properties are very fascinating. You can also find situations in which the, the, the here is an example of a paper which was published in nature uh, about a decade ago. Uh, this was an experiment uh, carried out at Princeton by Wang and his uh, teammates in which they managed to get a laser pulse travel at more than 300 times the speed of light. Now, it does not mean that you are violating any fundamental rules in physics okay? uh, and how all this reconciles with the fundamental rules in physics is a matter of detail. It is very fascinating. Uh, you have to deal with very complex dispersive phenomena. There is this normal dispersion, there is anomalous dispersion. You, uh, in which the refractive index uh, actually decreases as the frequency increases, not uh, increases, but it decreases. That is the case of uh, anomalous dif um, uh, dispersion. So, what uh, you will find in anomalous dispersion is that if light were to go through a medium which has got anomalous dispersive properties, the ordering of red and blue will be reversed. And there are even more fascinating materials, uh, which are like meta materials in which you even have negative refractive index and so on. So, there is 
uh, that is something for you to read about. I will leave you with one picture uh, before we conclude this unit. Uh, this is a picture um, taken from uh, the Maid of the Mist uh, boat ride near the Niagara Falls. And this is a picture of a lovely rainbow. Uh, this is taken because of the, there is a mist in the fall of the Niagara Falls. And here I am going to leave you with one or two questions for you to ponder over. Questions which probably come to your mind already on seeing this picture. Why is it the why does a rainbow have red outside and blue inside? The other question is which part of the picture is the brightest and why? So, this is not going to be a part of our discussion today, but these are the questions I would like to leave you with. And if there are any questions, a rainbow is always such a lovely sight. In fact, sometimes you see a double rainbow and then you have to ask yourself what is the ordering of red and blue in the second rainbow. But I will let you worry about these questions and uh, the answers come from the simple phenomenology that we have talked about okay, together with some simple you know techniques that you use in doing optics and it comes from this essential consideration that the refractive index is frequency dependent. And the, I will give you as a hint that this refraction of course, is in water droplets. So, water has got a refractive index which is different for the red and different for the blue. For the red the refractive index is about 1.331 and for the red uh, for the for the red it is 1.331 for the blue it is 1.343. So, they are not exact they are slightly different and the answer lies in this the details are for you to work out. So, I guess I will stop here and then next time we meet we will go over to unit 3 in which we will learn about various coordinate systems. We will begin with the plane polar coordinates and then the cylindrical polar and the spherical polar coordinate systems. We will learn about the dynamical symmetry of the Kepler problem and various other things as this course will progress. So, thank you all and we will conclude unit 2 and begin with unit 3 the next time.